Hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing on the commercial space landscape, innovation, market, and policy. I especially want to thank our distinguished panel of witnesses today and uh, express my gratitude for you being here. From the Apollo program and the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 that we just celebrated, to the Viking landers on Mars, the Landsat Earth observing satellites, and the Hubble Space Telescope, the private space sector has been a trusted partner in America's civil space program. While, federal government, while the federal government has taken the lead in R&D investments, design, development, testing, and construction of infrastructure and facilities, it has looked to the aerospace industry and its skilled workforce to impl implement the government's mission requirements and build many of the spacecraft, instruments, vehicles, satellites, and systems that the government has launched into space. This partnership has worked well, and the nation's successes in civil space owe much to the partnership between government and industry. Through these government investments, demonstrated capabilities have led to flourishing segments of the commercial space industry. And today, the global space economy, including government space budgets, is estimated to be around $350 to $400 billion. Sectors within that global economy, such as satellite television, satellite manufacturing, and ground equipment and devices, like the chips in our smartphone that enable navigation, produce annual revenues in the tens to hundreds of billions of dollars. Congress and government policies as well have supported the development of a commercial space industry by setting the frameworks for regulating segments of the industry. This committee's Commercial Space Launch Act of 1984 laid the initial regulatory framework to enable the emergence of a commercial space launch industry, for example. Other legislation provided a pathway for commercial remote sensing licensing. And today, the commercial space industry is evolving. With these changes have come innovative technologies and operations and potential new services and capabilities that are infusing uh, energy and excitement into the commercial space industry. Private investors, venture capital, and other forms of investment are also expressing interest and in investing in the industry. According to one source, total investment in startup space companies was at a record $3.2 billion in 2018, up from about $2.5 billion in 2017. We are on the precipice of what could be a groundbreaking shift in technologies and services that affect our daily lives, whether through new broadband communication services or information products derived from Earth remote sensing imagery. I'm excited about the future of commercial space, and I want the commercial space industry in the United States to succeed and to lead. To ensure continued success, it is important that we, as a subcommittee with jurisdiction over commercial space, have a clear view of where the industry is and where the industry is headed, the opportunities and challenges facing it, where and how the government intersects with commercial space, and what questions need to be answered as we carry out oversight of the government as a user and enabler of commercial space activities. So before we delve into any one issue or activity or segment of the industry specifically, we're starting today with an overview of commercial space. In short, today's hearing is intended to be a commercial space 101, if you will, to guide us into prioritizing the key issues and areas to examine as we look forward to subsequent hearings on commercial space during the 116th Congress. We've included a variety of voices on the panel, including those representing the breadth and diversity of the industry, and I look forward to your in input today. Uh, thank you, and um, the chair now recognizes uh, Ranking Member Babin for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it, and I want to say welcome and thank you to all our expert witnesses. Our nation's history in space has always featured partnerships with industry. From McDonnell Aircraft Corporation building the Mercury and the Gemini capsules to Grumman building the lunar excursion module for Apollo, 
Are the United Space Alliance operating the space shuttle fleet? Contractors and private sector have worked hand in hand with NASA since the dawn of the space age. The future will be no different. In order to ensure that our nation, government, military, industrial base, and society will continue to benefit from the unique opportunities that space affords, we must carefully craft a framework for the future. And that's why I was very pleased to see the administration put forward Space Policy Directives 1, 2, and 3. SPD 1 directed NASA to lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners to enable human expansion across the solar system and to bring back to Earth new knowledge and opportunities. I applaud this goal. Since uh, space exploration will require collaboration with the private sector just as it did 50 years ago when Apollo 11 first landed on the moon. As we chart a new course, NASA must find the right balance of how it procures hardware and services. If done correctly, NASA can leverage private sector investments to enable national exploration goals. If done poorly, private public-private partnerships could end up simply as corporate welfare. We must carefully guard against subjecting our civil space enterprise to the uncertainty of the marketplace. To paraphrase a former Secretary of the Treasury and Director of the National Economic Council, the government is a poor venture capitalist. We must ensure that any cooperation is based on sound market projections and that the private sector truly has skin in the game. Turning to the other space policy directives uh, related to commercial space, SPD 2 and 3 directed agencies to streamline the regulation of private sector space activities and provide better space situational awareness to, to uh, space operators. In response to these directives, agencies are working to craft rules to cut red tape while also providing certainty to the market and meeting our domestic and international obligations. Despite the best intentions of the administration, the, the first attempts by the Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce, and the Federal Communication Commission all seem to fall short. But this is not surprising. Regulatory path is fraught with uncertainty, beholden to the whims of unelected bureaucracies, and unresponsive to the needs of a rapidly innovating field. But there are a multitude of other constructs that can satisfy our obligations without stifling innovation or smothering the embers of creativity. Standard-setting bodies, self-regulating organizations, carefully crafted public-private partnerships, and many other solutions should all be on the table. How we craft space regulations is imperative to our future in space. Other states stand willing to challenge U.S. leadership in space through regulatory competition. In a global environment, individuals and companies are free to shop for the most attractive environment to claim as home. The implications of this choice go far beyond national pride. When space operators associate themselves with a particular nation, they bring jobs, economic growth, and tax revenue. They attract the best and the brightest entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and technicians, and they create an incubator for future success. We cannot afford to scare these folks away to other nations that will gladly provide a flag of convenience for them. Aside from the established commercial space industries like communications, launch, and remote sensing, we must also consider new and unique activities such as space-to-space -space remote sensing, commercial space-based signal collection, space resource utilization, satellite servicing, and commercial habitat services, amongst many others. None of these activities were seriously envisioned 50 years ago. And so it stands to reason that we have no idea what the next 50 years will have in store for us. And how we structure partnerships between our civil and commercial space sector and how we uh, will regulate our private sector activities is one of the fundamental space policy questions of our time. Whether or not our system of values will be carried by the future pioneers of outer space will very likely hinge on the degree to which America is able to unleash the awesome power of freedom, liberty, and protect against government overreach. 
I, for one, want to see the future of humanity in outer space guided by the principles of our great nation. The commercial space sector holds great promise, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to make sure that the commercial space policies, laws, and regulations that we adopt in the future will enable accomplishments just as amazing as those that we celebrated just last week. And I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Babin, I, and uh, Ranking Member, excuse me, uh, and welcome again, everyone. I will uh, now introduce our distinguished panel of witnesses, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Bhava Lal. Dr. Lal is a research staff member at the Institute for Defense Analysis, Science, and Technology Policy Institute. There, Dr. Lal leads strategy, technology assessment, and policy studies and analysis for federal space-oriented agencies. Dr. Lal regularly serves on the National Academy of Science Committees and is currently serving on the NOAA Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing. Dr. Lal holds a bachelor's degree and master's degree in nuclear engineering from MIT and a master's degree from MIT's technology and policy program and a doctoral degree in public policy and public administration from George Washington University. Welcome, Dr. Lal. Our next witness is Carissa Christensen. Ms. Christensen is the founder and CEO of Bryce Space and Technology, an analytics and engineering firm with expertise in space, cyber, and advanced R&D. She sits on the board of the Aerospace Center for Space Policy and Strategy and serves on the National Research Council's Space Technology Industry Government University Roundtable Advisory Group to NASA. That is a mouthful. Ms. Christensen holds a Master of Public Policy degree from Harvard University. She also completed the general course in government at the London School of Economics and was a Douglas Scholar at Rus Rutgers University. Welcome, Ms. Christensen. Our next witness is Mr. Eric Stalmer. Mr. Stalmer is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, a trade organization dedicated to promoting the development of commercial space flight. He was recently appointed to the National Space, Space Council User Advisory Group. Before working at CSF, Mr. Stalmer served as the Vice President of Government Relations at Analytical Graphics, Inc., and Mr. Stalmer has a bachelor's degree in political science and history from Mount St. Mary College and master's degree in public administration from George Mason University. Welcome, Mr. Stalmer. Our next witness is Mr. Mike French. Mr. French is the Vice President for Space Systems at the Aerospace Industries Association, or AIA, a trade association representing manufacturers and suppliers of the U.S. aerospace industry. He previously served as the Senior Vice President for Commercial Space at Bryce Space and Technology. Mr. French held several federal government positions, most recently serving as NASA's Chief of, St Chief of Staff, where he received NASA's Distinguished Service Medal for his service. Mr. French holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of California, uh, Berkeley, and a Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School. Welcome, Mr. French. And our final witness today is Ms. Laura Montgomery. Ms. Montgomery teaches space law at Catholic University Columbus School of Law. She also writes and edits the law blog, Ground-Based Space Matters. Previously, Ms. Montgomery spent over two decades with the Federal Aviation Administration, serving as the manager of space of, of the there we go the space law branch in the office of chief counsel as the FAA's senior attorney for commercial space transportation. Ms. Montgomery received her bachelor degree from the University of Virginia and her law degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ms. Montgomery. And before we begin our, our testimony and, uh, and, and questions, uh, I will take a moment to introduce uh, a, a letter that has been uh, submitted for the record, will submit it into the record at this time, from the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration uh, on the NPRM, uh, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and we'll submit that to the record at this time. And now, as our witnesses, you should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony, of course, will be uh, added into the record and can be more expansive. 
and at, for the hearing. And when you have completed your spoken testimony, we'll begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel, and we will go in the same order of introduction. So we'll start with Dr. Lal. Dr. Lal, you'll recognize for five minutes. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Bavin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In my remarks, I would like to address three questions. First, what is commercial space? Second, what benefits does it bring? And third, how can the government best leverage commercial space? So what's commercial space? The term is used loosely and generally brought up in three different contexts. Some people use it to describe commercial companies that are often, but not always, startups. These companies put angel or venture funding or their own resources at risk to build space systems. For others, it refers to commercial approaches which are often fixed-price, milestone-based contracts, typically used in our market-based economy, but, but much less so by space agencies. Yet others refer to it in the context of firms having primarily private customers or customers other than the US government. Thus, in using the term commercial space, most people are alluding either to innovative startups, non-traditional contracting mechanisms, or non-governmental customers. The second question is, what benefit does commercial space bring? Commercial style contracts, such as the one mentioned above, as well as private investors with skin in the game, as Representative Babin said, uh, incentivize two kinds of behaviors, rapid development and a focus on cost reduction. As a result, the most important benefit commercial space brings is lower cost, although at times this is at the expense of performance and reliability. Given the potential for cost savings, commercial approaches are not just being considered in the launch sector, where cost savings have been well documented, but also in other sectors that actually used to be considered the sole province of the government. Examples include SSA, or space, space Situation Awareness, Space Nuclear Power, on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing, and even deep space science. Commercial space has brought more than cost savings into the space sector. In some cases, commercial capabilities have surpassed or are entirely complementary to government ones. Commercial companies have leveraged innovations such as miniaturization, satellite mass production, and use of commercial off-the-shelf components to produce capable lightweight satellites. These satellites can be simultaneously deployed, meaning that many hundreds can be launched and operated and provide round-the-clock, simultaneous, multi-point, imagery of any place on Earth or in space for scientific, national security, and commercial purposes. This coverage is obviously impractical with traditional satellites. My last point on this question is that despite the high levels of innovation and cost effectiveness, if you draw the system boundaries around space-based activities, the principal customers of commercial space today and in the near term are governments, not private. And there are only a handful of exceptions, such as satellite communication and satellite TV, that are paid for by private entities. Lack of demand in the private sector constrains robust development and growth in the commercial space sector. The final question is, how can the government best leverage commercial space? Our research has shown that government purchases of products and services from commercial companies or using commercial approaches has the twin benefit of reducing cost, accelerating the development of many government space programs, as well as fostering the growth of the space sector and promoting the industrialization of space. In light of potential government benefits and commercial needs, we have two recommendations. First, at a conceptual level, space agencies should design mission plans and architectures that are sufficiently flexible such that when commercial capabilities reach adequate readiness levels, they can be incorporated in these missions and architectures. For example, several companies are exploring water extraction systems on the moon, and other companies are investing in technologies and systems related to space-based propellant depots and tugs in low Earth orbit. NASA should have architectures in place, so when these capabilities are commercially available, the government can quickly transition their operations to exploit them. Second, and more concretely, space agencies should consider as a norm rather than as an exception, fixed price, milestone-based contracts, 
when purchasing space goods and services. In some cases, a cost plus contract is necessary and appropriate, for example, for certain high risk de developmental items. But more often than not, fixed price contracts suffice and allow companies to propose their own innovative solutions. The overarching question, therefore, when considering commercial solutions that must be asked is, would we consider accepting, in cases where it makes sense, an 80% solution at half the cost and double the speed? I'd be happy to expand on any of these points. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Law. Ms. Christensen. Uh, Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here to discuss the commercial space landscape. Uh, I've provided independent analysis of space activities for more than three decades, and I've... Uh, certainly. Better? Move it a little closer to your mouth. It'll, there, there you go. Better? <clears throat> I've built my career and my business on the principle that evidence-based objectivity and rigor are critical to effective decision-making, and I'm pleased to share uh, my analysis with the committee. Uh, today, I'll talk about uh, three elements of commercial space activities, the, the current commercial space economy, recent investment and emerging space ventures, and the important implications of this innovation for government. The commercial space economy has existed for decades, dominated by well-established satellite operators providing television, internet, and many other services. Launch and satellite manufacturing enable those services. Considering <coughs> key industry sectors as well as government space budgets, the value of the global space economy is about $360 billion. A quarter of that is government space budgets and half of that is the US. The remaining global space economy, more than $275 billion in 2018, is dominated by revenues from satellite services and related products. Two large markets, direct to home television, satellite television, and location and mapping based on the US global positioning system and other navigation satellites are by far the biggest contributors to total industry revenue at about $100 billion each. Satellite service revenues overall have been growing at about the same rate of the, as, as the global economy roughly 2 to 3%. The outlook for established services is fairly stable. I'll talk in a moment about satellites, innovative satellite startups. In general, my expectation is that those startups will tend to augment rather than replace current capabilities. Looking toward the future, emerging space businesses seek to expand the commercial landscape. Today, we're seeing unprecedented numbers of new space businesses enabled by three factors. New technology, in particular very small satellites, new markets uh, from satellite services to in-orbit activities, and new investors. Uh, billionaire super angel investors and venture capital firms have invested between two and three billion dollars a year since 2015 in emerging space ventures, with the majority invested in US companies. While a few companies, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and OneWeb, account for a substantial proportion of this investment, it has resulted in more than 250 new space firms. Venture investment is relatively new to the space industry. These investors bring risk tolerance that allows ventures to pursue unproven business plans in riskier markets. As a result, generally, more than three quarters of venture funded firms fail. Uh, regardless of the success or failure, I want to note that capital being directed to technology and capability development today may result in val valuable outcomes for the government and industry. Looking at these new businesses, they include broadband satellite service providers, launch companies, companies seeking to operate in low Earth orbit, and many others. New companies in low Earth orbit seek to offer a variety of services, including manufacturing, transportation, um, and so on. Based on today's demand signals, these businesses have a limited customer base. The most promising markets are human accommodations, especially for government astronauts, and on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing. The exploration activities of the US government and its partners will have a significant effect, significant effect on most LEO businesses. These new firms create both opportunities and challenges for the government. The government is a longstanding customer of commercial space capabilities and helped facilitate today's commercial space markets. The government has an opportunity to leverage emerging commercial space companies to help it do more and spend less. However, the price of leveraging this investor-funded dynamic innovation is uncertainty. The government must carefully consider how to take best advantage of this opportunity 
while assuring long-term access to mission critical services. I appreciate the opportunity to share my analysis and findings, and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Mr. Stalmer. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting the Commercial Space, Commercial Space Flight Federation back to discuss the progress of the U.S. commercial space industry. From the Commercial Space Launch Act of 1984 through today, this committee has steadfastly supported the unleashing of American free enterprise to develop the economic opportunities of space. Every major commercial space policy law was born here in this room. And we hope you understand how vital the bipartisanship work that this committee and the House has been to our industry's growing success. The United States is undergoing a renaissance in space led by commercial enterprise. Since 2009, investors have supported over 476 private space companies with over $22 billion in private capital. In my written statement, I outlined several of the commercial space industry's recent major milestones, which sets the stage for even greater accomplishments. As NASA continues to drive the frontier onward with groundbreaking research, the commercial sector is making space affordable and accessible. We are in the defining moments of a new era of space exploration and development, and it's critical that we work together to improve our policy environment to ensure continued U.S. leadership in space. Accordingly, I offer the following recommendations. We need to streamline our federal regulations. We complement the FAA for getting the proposed rule out fairly, uh, delayed only by the government shutdown, uh, fairly quickly, I should say. Uh, unfortunately, instead of one giant leap forward, the FAA seems to have taken only a cautious half step towards regulatory regime needed by the growing and diverse new space transportation providers and their many users. The 580 page NPRM plus over a thousand pages of supporting documents is very complex and, and frequently confusing. Its preamble cites, cites many of the right goals but the proposed regula regulations do not deliver on them. Most current or prospective FAA, FAA space licensees have determined that the NPRM in some ways are worse than today's obsolete rules. The NPRM is not adequate, adequately performance-based like it was intended. It adds new burdens and cost. It's confusing and relies on missing documents. It lacks the flexibility to allow for innovation uh, it's anti-competitive in many ways, creating new burdens to entry for users. And it attempts to fix things that were not broken and add an even more than burden to the users. That is why all the licensed applicants in the Commercial Space Flight Federation, including our largest spaceports, plus several other entrepreneurial companies, all want DOT and FAA using the, all the, the, using the many available mechanisms for active industry interaction to develop and publish a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking. We appreciate the administration's eagerness to reform the FAA's obsolete rules, but we really need to get this right. The companies are there that are growing, innovating, and improving America's access to space are requesting major revisions to this NPRM so that the FAA must take the time to engage with everyone, including the newest members of our industry, so the agency can craft the rules for the future. We also must expand on NASA's use of COTS-like partnerships with the commercial industry for human exploration. By even most conservative analysis, the COTS commercial cargo public-private partnership saved NASA hundreds of millions of dollars. Why? Commercial space is underpinned by a pay-for-performance, fixed-price contracts, agile and creative development teams, greater flexibility and risk tolerance, private capital investment and more and more intensive innovation. This is not CSF's opinion, but the conclusion of numerous independent re reviews of program. For example, in 2014, a report praised the COTS ISS Cargo Public-Private Partnership, and I quote, because these were partnerships, not traditional contracts, NASA leveraged its $800 million COTS budget with partner funds, 
This resulted in two, two new U.S. medium-class launch vehicles and two automated cargo spacecraft and demonstrated the efficiency of such partnerships. A 2017 cost analysis review was more direct. The COTS development and later operation commercial resupply services are significant advances in affordability by any measure. Simply, simply put, this approach works. Last week, we celebrated the historic achievements of our nation a half century ago as we came together for a common goal in space. And it's right and it's natural to honor our past, but we should also be proud and excitement about the advancements we are achieving today. And what we can accomplish together tomorrow, if we accomplish together tomorrow, if we build a true partnership between government, including Congress, and the American people and their enterprise. Chairman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, uh, thank you for your invitation and attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Stalmer. Mr. French. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Aerospace Industries Association represents nearly 340 companies at the heart of the American economy. The aerospace industry that generates nearly $930 billion in economic output and nearly $90 billion in trade surplus, the largest of any U.S. sector. Our industry is supported by more than 2.5 million American workers, and our members have partnered with NASA since its beginning. But today our eyes are firmly fixed on the future. This year, AIA released a report entitled, What's Next for Aerospace and Defense? A Vision for 2050. This report paints a picture of the innovations that will drive the way we move, connect, explore, and defend our interests 30 years from now. And many of these technologies will depend on an effective partnership between government and the commercial space industry. As Dr. Law said, there's been much discussion about commercial space, but the term is often inconsistently applied. The commercial space industry is not a new phenomenon. It is part of a $360 billion economy that's existed for decades. Commercial space companies range from established publicly traded companies to large private companies to startups that are still developing their business plans. For example, NASA's commercial crew and cargo partners are the Boeing Corporation, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and SpaceX. In an important trend, these large public space companies are now among the most active venture capital investors in space startups. In, de in, in, deciding how to de in, in deciding how to partner with this diverse set of actors, government has a variety of different tools and approaches it can use depending on where the market is. For example, NASA took a new approach in the commercial cargo and crew programs, creating what I'll call a public investment private service or PIPs model. Under PIPs, NASA subsidized the creation of commercial service by being the primary customer while requiring investment from its commercial partners. NASA determined that the PIPs model was viable for commercial cargo and crew because of the existence of the multi-billion dollar commercial launch industry. Over the last few weeks, NASA announced its intent to use the PIPs model for the Artemis program's human lunar lander. This is a new extension of the model, and it presents three primary risks that I wanted to raise with you today. First, there's no established market offering for, this, for NASA to buy here. The capability of landing humans on the moon will require a great deal of development before it can be provided to NASA as a service. Second, requiring companies to invest internal funds in a nascent market may prevent firms that, that otherwise are highly capable, especially small and mid-sized firms, from being able to compete. Third, purchasing services will require a clear outline of government versus industry responsibilities, as was required in the cargo and crew programs. But this would be more complex as this will take place with an entirely new program operating deeper in space. These risks will require NASA to make a robust assessment of where the proposals it receives meet technical and schedule requirements and limit default. It also requires NASA to clearly delineate these government industry responsibilities, which may require NASA to change its approach in some areas. We urge NASA to consider industry's feedback to help mitigate these risks as it proceeds. Moving forward, Congress can provide direction on these approaches as it considers NASA's next authorization and appropriation bills. Of course, Congress's actions are not limited to procurement policy. One essential component to commercial growth worth noting is reliable, interference-free spectrum. A viable commercial space landscape requires a comprehensive approach to our nation's future spectrum policy that ensures adequate and globally harmonized spectrum. 
As government looks to meet its future space requirements, Congress should continue to be an active ally to commercial space, whether through passing a multi-year NASA authorization, ensuring we have the most talented workforce, or deciding the best procurement strategies. Regardless, the commercial space industry is primed to partner with government and meet the next set of space challenges, from the continued support of U.S. national security space to returning to the moon and onto Mars. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. French. Ms. Montgomery. Thank you. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate today. Three regulatory agencies oversee U.S. commercial space activities. The FAA authorizes and regulates commercial space transportation, launch and reentry, but does not have authority on orbit. The FCC oversees communication satellites, and NOAA regulates remote sensing satellites. In response to administration calls for streamlining, the three agencies have issued notices of proposed rulemaking to fix their regulations. They have made good attempts, but the FAA and FCC have also taken the opportunity to impose new regulations, not all of which are clearly within the authority granted to them by Congress. The FAA, for one, proposes to ask payload operators, whom Congress neither told it to license nor regulate, whether they encrypt their transmissions. But is this request for information actually a disguised requirement? Although Congress has given the FAA some authority over payloads in that the FAA may stop a launch for payload concerns, Congress has otherwise been clear that it has not provided the FAA the authority to regulate payloads. The, FAA, the FCC also issued an NPRM to modify its orbital debris regulations in stark contrast to Congress's financial risk approach for space transportation, the FCC proposes that satellite operators indemnify the U.S. government against damage claims. If Congress has not said that the satellite industry must protect the U.S. government, one might ask, first, how the FCC thinks it has the authority to do so, and second, why it has chosen a different path for a related space industry. Because it is the legislative branch, Congress has the ability to choose a different path for satellites. The FCC does not. There are three controversial provisions of the Outer Space Treaty that Congress could interpret in favor of incentivizing private commerce. It is my own view that interpretations that incentivize are the right ones. The first involves the regulation of private entities in space. Article 6 of the treaty says, that the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party. The FAA has ind indicated that it may deny a private entity access to space if the private entity's activities are not federally regulated. This part of the treaty is not, however, self-executing, which means that it does not create an obligation on the private sector until Congress says so by passing legislation. The treaty does not say that I, either all or any particular activity must be authorized, which leaves decisions regarding what activities require regulation to the member states. And in the United States, those decisions are up to Congress, not the FAA. The FAA's position ignores the Supreme Court in Medellin versus Texas, where the court held that not even the president could enforce a non-self-executing treaty. The FAA should thus not claim the power to use the treaty to deny a non-governmental entity access to space. Next come property rights. The treaty bars national appropriation in outer space. This creates legal uncertainty for the private sector. For U.S. companies, Congress resolved half the uncertainty by recognizing private claims to extracted resources back in 2015. Property rights in land are less certain. Many interpret the outer space treaties as barriers to private property under different theories. A careful reading, however, shows that contrary theories may better reflect what the treaties actually say. Finally, the outer space treaty admonishes states parties to avoid harmful contamination of outer space. There are two questions at issue here. First, does the admonition apply to non-governmental entities? Does the treaty, and second, does the treaty's 
harmful contamination mean the same thing as NAS NASA's planetary protection policy, under which spacecraft undergo expensive sterilization procedures. First, the treaty limits this requirement, like many others, to states' parties, to governments, and their missions. When the drafters of the treaty intended a requirement to not apply to non-governmental entities, they said so. Here, they did not. Next, although the treaty warns against harmful contamination, NASA's planetary protection policy would avoid almost all contamination in order to preserve its ability to study other worlds in their natural states. NASA thus not only avoids what the ordinary person might consider harmful, but microbial contamination as well. NASA is being a good science steward, but it is a NASA policy and not the law. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. Thank you, Ms. Montgomery, and thank you to all of our witnesses. We will now begin with uh, questions, and I uh, recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Uh, this is clearly an, a, an important issue. There are, there are many questions that we need to answer, and uh, to all of the panelists, thank you for being here. Your testimonies have raised a number of important issues, including streamlining, streamlining regulations, understanding the uncertainties and risks, and considering contracting and procurement options, the role of innovation, emerging markets and services, and we could go on. And one of the purpose, uh, purposes of this hearing today is, is stage setting, to identify, uh, to identify the types of challenges and opportunities that we need to tackle as the space industry moves into really a new generation. And it's important that we have full insight into what these issues are to, to delve deeper. So as we want the industry su to succeed and we want to get it right from the, the regulatory and from the, uh, our role as an oversight committee, uh, I'd like to hear from all of the witnesses very briefly your top two priorities uh, into what the subcommittee looks at to delving further into the commercial space activities and issues. So I'll just start and we'll go down. Dr. Lal. Sure. Um, I would say that the, the top two priorities ought to be uh, uh, looking at alternative mechanisms of contracting with commercial entities. Many small companies, startups, do not have the ability to have the, uh, the, the background for the kind of contracts that are traditionally used. And the second one is to understand that there may not be, at least in the near term, private markets, and therefore there is more support needed for the, from the government to support emerging commercial companies. I would uh, say first, working with uh, startup and early stage companies in an effective way uh, and finding a path to manage the business uncertainty they face with the technology and capability innovation that they bring to uh, the table that the government can, uh, can uh, uh, generate value from. And second, more broadly, uh, thinking about leveraging the commercial investment that we see today across uh, space markets. I think in the near term, uh, the most challenging um, regulatory hurdle we have in front of us right now is this uh, NPRM as we're looking at uh, how the, the launch uh, industry is regulated and the effort to streamline this. Um, the current rule as it's proposed uh, it really causes a lot of barriers to the innovative companies that are, that are entering the launch market. Uh, when you look at the global uh, space economy, launch is, is uh, only a small part of it, but really is a critical part if, to enable the, the success of this whole great uh, commercial uh, sp global space marketplace. Um, and I'd also agree with uh, Dr. Lal uh, on the, uh, the contracting mechanisms and how we um, procure services. I, I look to the model of uh, the commercial off-the-shelf um, products or com uh, with uh, the COTS uh, regime that we've used in the past, uh, leveraging the private sector with the, the, that type of investment and uh, having uh, both parties have skin in the game. I think that's really critical. The first one I would have is uh, the, the committee uh, looking at a multi-year NASA authorization, and through that being able to provide guidance on many of these issues, including the purpose uh, and, and mission that uh, NASA should have between its national programs and, and, the, and the purchase of services. Um, I'd say uh, a second one would be, as I mentioned, my oral testimony, Spectrum. I mean, Spectrum is the invisible nervous system of 
of space. And without it, we can't talk to our satellites and, and, and it, they can't talk back to us. Thank you. Looking at it from a legal perspective, I think my interests and priorities would be more long-term in terms of encouraging investment and regulatory certainty going forward for the private community. And in that regard, I would strongly recommend that Congress um, set to rest concerns that um, that the executive branch has the ability to usurp Congress's legislative role by denying private actors access to space under Article VI of the treaty. The second one I would strongly urge you all to consider is um, setting forth some sort of criteria by which we would be able to recognize private actors' ability to own land on celestial bodies, whether through principles of adverse possession or otherwise. Um, I think it is something that Congress wants to take into account for long-term purposes. Thank you all. Um, so with the little time we have left, uh, Ms. Christensen, I want to, uh, to focus uh, on, on a piece of your testimony. Uh, you noted that the price of lev leveraging investor-funded dynamic innovation is uncertainty in, in terms of the government's mission. And uh, Mr. French, you also commented on the need for a detailed assessment uh, and clear predefined determination of government versus industry responsibilities. And in considering public investment and the private service model for procurement uh, for, certain, for government missions and certain elements, uh, especially those that might involve human safety, uh, what are the guardrails that we can put in place to appropriately manage these risks? And how can we ensure that the government aligns its decisions in leveraging innovative capabilities with the potential risk to the taxpayer and, and to mission assurance as well as human risk? And we have very little time left, so I'll let you both briefly answer that. Uh, very, qu very quickly, um, uh, implementing acqu acquisition processes and partnering mechanisms that recognize and specifically address the business uncertainty associated with early stage companies that will help the government benefit while managing risk. I, and I'd say it starts with what does the government want out of the program and what is that, what is its, what is the core priority? And then from there, optimizing around that. Um, instead of, it, it, where you have multiple goals, you can sometimes lose sight of a primary uh, risk such as human safety. Thank you. I now yield to my distinguished colleague, the ranking member, Mr. Babin, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Stalmer, uh, Chairwoman Horn entered into the record the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration's letter supporting the FAA's uh, NPRM for commercial space launch and reentry. However, your testimony highlights several issues with the FAA's proposed regulations. From your perspective, would these regulations advance U.S. leadership in commercial space or set us back? And if they would set us back, do you see a viable path to fixing that? I think the regulations as they're currently written in this draft um, would definitely set us back. Uh, it's not, it's, it tends to be more of the status quo. Uh, in a dynamic environment where innovation is occurring with new launch entrants, uh, it creates more burdens for a lot of these new entrants, and especially in different categories. These, these rules are primarily written for uh, expendable launch vehicles, you know, which is more the, the legacy of uh, the, the launch industry. It doesn't take into account um, capture, carry, hybrid, reusable vehicles. So I, I think there's a, there's a path forward with recommendations that we've made uh, that could benefit all the, um, all the launch providers. I got you. They need to be modernized a little bit for uh, I think updated with the vehicles. changing times. Okay. All right, thank you. And Ms. Montgomery, uh, is it doctor or Mrs.? Ms. Mrs., okay. The U.S. Senate recently passed legislation to protect the Apollo landing sites. A companion bill was introduced in the House to commemorate Apollo 11. The bill would regulate private sector activity based on NASA policies without following the Administrative Procedures Act. It would also direct the administration to negotiate an international agreement to protect the sites. This is a very laudable goal, but is this the best way to conserve the sites? India recently launched a lander to the south pole of the moon, and if all goes well, uh, presumably they would want to protect their first landing site. 
Could this bill set a precedent that precludes U.S. exploration of the lunar south pole, for instance, where there's billions of tons of water, and serve as a backdoor way of staking a claim, quote unquote, to regions on the moon? Your comments. Um, this is an issue that has only been something I've recently thought about, so um, these are more, more recent thoughts. Um, one, one concern I would have about the, the way the bill works is that internationally there may be some concern that uh, attempts to set up an exclusion zone could constitute national appropriation. And so I don't know where the thinking is on that, but it would certainly be something to explore as a possible concern under the Outer Space Treaty because the Outer Article II does bar national appropriation. Secondly, I would worry about um, whether it allows for emergency landings because it, some of those, those policies may, may not allow that. Uh, my third concern with it is that both, bi ver both bills provide that the... Um, NASA policy would apply, and NASA is not a regulatory agency, and so it is not, the policies have been written without going through the notice and comment okay. period. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. French, the Department of Defense developed the Atlas and Delta launch vehicles with a 75, 80% of funding coming from the contractors, and only 10, 20 to 25% coming from the taxpayer. NASA developed the commercial cargo program by sharing their development costs with SpaceX and Orbital Sciences 50-50. SpaceX and Boeing currently receive 90% of their development funding for the commercial crew program from the taxpayer. NASA recently announced that the lunar landers will also be funded by the taxpayer at least 90%. The rationale <clears throat> for the early partnerships was that contractor uh, could also sell to other customers, which would lower the government's cost. The success of such an approach is dependent upon the potential market outside of the U.S. government. There appears to be a market for robotic landers, but is there a market outside of NASA for human-rated lunar landers that could defray the cost of the government and justify a public-private partnership at this point? Uh, thank you, sir. There is, there's no current uh, market in this area, uh, unlike the, the case of the multi-billion dollar commercial launch market. And so it raises that risk of are you possibly excluding uh, some pretty capable companies if you require them to put money in an area where they don't, aren't able to realize a return in a five to seven year period where they have to make those decisions. Okay, thank you very much. And I am expired, so I'll yield back, thank you. Well, it looks like you're still here, but your, your time <laughs> is up, so. Uh, don't, don't, don't go anywhere. Right. We like having you around. Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Chris, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank all of you for being here today. Um, maybe sort of an out-of-the-box question, but um, who, who are the three largest players in commercial space today? And for any of you or all of you to answer, since this is 101. Well, I think, again, if you go by the definitions, and again, as Mike French said, you know, Lockheed Martin's, uh, you know, can be considered no less commercial than SpaceX or Blue Origin. So, so, uh, so, but if you were to define commercial space as, you know, newer companies that are using more fixed price type contracts with the government, I would say SpaceX, Blue Origin, Planet, maybe some of the bigger commercial <coughs> companies um, though obviously, as I said, Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop are commercial as well. Right. Uh, so I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, there are very sizable satellite operators, um, SES, Intelsat, uh, AT&T operates direct-to-home television uh, capabilities. Those are very substantial commercial companies operating in space. Uh, thinking about uh, human space flight and on-orbit activities, there, just as Dr. Lal said, uh, the major companies, uh, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, and uh, looking at the venture-funded firms, the, the companies that have specifically had in their history this new kind of investment financing, I would, I would say that the largest is SpaceX by far. Uh, that's a very widely accepted um, unicorn, more than a billion dollars in valuation. Uh, they're well over. Uh, 30 billion at this point in valuation, a privately held company. 
Blue Origin, and then the satellite startup OneWeb, which has received very substantial investment, um, several billion dollars to uh, uh, design and to deploy a global broadband satellite constellation using small satellites. And I would concur in a lot of the second, you know, the, if you look at the different segments, you know, from the commercial satellite to commercial launch, um, you know, what we often talk about SpaceX and what Blue Origin's doing and, and Virgin Galactic and Sierra Nevada Corporation, um, and certainly, you know, uh, companies that are involved with these, uh, the commercial cargo and the commercial crew, you know, they, they view themselves as well as commercial companies. So um, there's many different definitions to what a commercial company is. Um, and I won't rank order them because I have 85 of them, and I think they're all great. So. <laughs> you ought to know it better than anybody. Right. Uh, you know, in my view, I'd look at you know first. I'd say, does this does the company have an active business right. uh, dealing with the commercial sector outside the U.S. government? And then, does, if you meet that threshold, then how big is it? How much is its revenues? Does it have profit? Sure. Many of these companies don't have don't have profit. And in that in that case, it's it's uh, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman with those criteria. And uh, Ms. Montgomery, I might have a little different question for you, if you don't mind. Um, you, you touched on the treaty and how we handle, I guess, property that's in space. And um, could you elaborate and sort of explain to us what this treaty is, who the parties to it are, um, how it has authority to exist? Sure. Um, back in 1967, the major spacefaring nations, principally the United States and the USSR, uh, signed the Outer Space Treaty, and it is uh, something that has been signed by most comp most countries, including all of the major spacefaring nations. So that includes Russia, India, China, Ru right. India, China, Australia, UK, everyone. Um, it has a provision in it under Article Two that bars national appropriation, and I always emphasize that national, because a lot of people take different parts of the treaty and say, well, if um, if this treaty bars governments from appropriating, it must also bar uh, private actors from appropriating outer space. So um, I disagree with all that, and I've laid out all the theories in my written testimony, but you probably don't want me to. Why do you disagree with that? Oh, well, first of all, just a plain reading of the text says national appropriation. And um, I am not a nation state, so if I could get up there and establish some adverse possession, maybe I'd have a claim. Um, like homesteading. Sure, sure, exactly. And I think that it would be useful for the United States to look at some form of homesteading in order to be in accordance with the treaty. Well, we did it for the United States. Right, right. Um, it, the, I've seen some clever theories presented, one of which is that you would recognize adverse possession rights of a person or a company of any nationality and that that should accommodate certain concerns under the treaties. So, you know, we look at property rights in outer space in two ways. One is extracted resources like mining, you know, pulling fishes from the sea, um, taking platinum group minerals from the craters of the moon or water, which might be more, more valuable. And that, I think, the United States has settled domestically. And Luxembourg has copied the United States by saying, we're going to recognize the rights of people who commit their labor and extract resources from the moon or asteroids. Um, where the uncertainty still remains is on terrain. This is a long-term concern, but I think that with the advent of venture capital and people willing to take risks, I think they might be t willing to take more risks with their money if they think that they can get a return, if they can mortgage and put up for collateral any land that they obtain, alienate, you know, sell it, transfer it, lease it. All of these things are valuable abilities rights that probably will help incentivize a lot of activity. And we can look at our own history to see how private property has led to prosperity. I think the same would hold going into the future. With the chair's indulgence, just a quick short question, because uh, my time is up. But the 67 um, treaty, was that ratified by the Congress? Yes, by the Senate, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chris. And uh, before I, I recognize our, our, our next, uh, our next uh, 
member for questioning. I, I have a I have a presentation for Mr. Olson who kindly pointed out in our last uh, in our last hearing that we were rapidly approaching OU Texas, and I, and I have something. I think you need some decoration for your office to prepare you. So. Paybacks. I know. You should be careful what you start. He needs a, you know, some some good. Uh, Boomer sooner. Let me see. Boomer sooner. Yeah, Boomer sooner. Let me see. He's a. Uh, he he needs some. He needs something to remind him of who's going to come out on top of the Red River rivalry. <laughs> I'm not, but you know, I, I I I am I am an oaky through and through, so I can't allow you know uh, my my friend uh, from Texas to, to take over. Yes. Uh, so, Madam Chair, apparently in this committee, there's still space for fun. Yes. <laughs> oh. But uh, I like it. I like it, Mr. Olson. You're recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. <laughs> hook him! <laughs> hook him! I'm sorry. Welcome to our five witnesses. My district sits in the shadow of the Johnson Space Center, the hu home of human space flight. In 2015, the FAA approved the Houston Space Port. It's a commercial launch port being built in Texas 22 at Ellington Joint Reserve Base right there in my district. Uh, that's the base that's done uh, most of the flight training for astronauts to JSC, what they've done there. They've got some military operations there, some helicopters, the Coast Guard. Uh, they fly drones out of there with the Army. Last month, they announced their first phase of construction for the spaceport. Based on the infrastructure, the streets, the water, the electricity, the city council in Houston has approved $18.8 million this past October for that infrastructure build. Their vision is to launch micro satellites from the spaceport there, help out with astronaut training, zero G train, get rid of the vomit comet, they call that bird that just flies for about 30 seconds down, they can't train, this can make a lot more training. Uh, they actually want some space tourism. Follow the flight that Alan Shepard, you know, just basically suborbital, go up for 10 minutes, come back down, fly the Gulf of Mexico. It's a great operation. They've got two tenants already there. They've got intuitive machines. They've been selected by NASA to build what's called the Nova C. That's a vehicle that's going to the moon it's by 2021 is the current plan. They've also got Trumbull Unlimited unmanned, which builds UAVs. As you know, those guys are good for data collection, and they were great during Hurricane Harvey. They see levees and people trapped real time. And so my point is, and these companies there, I've got a lot of companies in Houston and all across the country, they're making great strides on commercial space ports like that in commercial space. Um, we've proven that commercial flights to the space station cargo are working, no doubt about that. I expect crew flights, human flights to the space station with commercial vehicles will not be a problem sometime, Mr. Stalmer, later this year. My question is, since we're doing commercial rockets to the space station for cargo and soon crew, how about we turn up the space station the commercial sector. Is that a good idea? There's been challenges we should know about. How about making it whole private? The space station, the vehicles that go up there, humans, cargo. I, uh, I certainly uh, appreciate your endorsement of that. And I think in time, uh, we, we may be there. I think uh, NASA has been a, a, an excellent partner on the space station. I think you see the great work that the um, ISS National Labs have been doing, formerly known as CASIS, uh, on, on opening the uh, the commercial marketplace on the International Space Station, what NanoRacks is doing, made in space. So it, the, the commercialization of the space station is slowly growing, um, and someday that, that may be the case that they turn it over to the commercial sector, and I think eventually we will see routine commercial flights um, to the International Space Station. So I'm. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about the, the work that's being done, but one thing we do need is the certainty that the space station will be there so we can you know, work to greater commercialize it. And as far as what the operations going on Houston and Ellington Field, I think it's a, it's a, a model for what is going on in other spaceports, the diversity of operations that they have going on and bringing in these new customers. And we see this uh, with many we, of, of the 12 spaceports uh, that we have here in the U.S., what they're doing, the diversity of bringing in um, 
a variety of companies and the testing that, that's going on and the flights that are going on. It's not just limited to the, the East Coast and West Coast ranges, which are also doing uh, fantastic work. I forgot to mention, too, education. San Jacinto College has set up an operation there at the spaceport to train the future technicians to do the manufacturing to run that spaceport. So again, private sector, private sector, private sector. Another question for you, Mr. Stalmer, is we're trying to go it looks like we got low Earth orbit pretty much settled for commercial. I don't think that's a big problem. But how about beyond low Earth orbit, going to the moon? I know it's a long way off, but we've been preparing for commercial vehicles and commercial crews to take us to the moon and maybe Mars and make this whole endeavor commercial? NASA set out, has set out a, a great vision with the Artemis program about bringing um, that the next step going back to the moon. And I know that the commercial sector is going to play a major role in landers, ascent vehicles, robotics, uh, and, and even with the gateway as, as we go down that, that step. So I think the role uh, and that partnership with NASA and the commercial sector is going to enable us at a, an affordable basis to do that, to, to further our deep space exploration. Thank you. I'm out of time. One further question. Can you sing, the eyes of Texas are upon you? I am going to work on that one, Congressman. Uh, being, a, being a Northeasterner, we, uh, we don't do that. Um, the, the chairwoman would suggest that's not fight, the best Texas idea. Texas fight. Yeah. Yes, uh, Congressman Waltz will probably want me to sing the VMI uh, alma mater song at some point. So uh, I got a lot of work to do in front of me on that one, but I, uh, I appreciate the challenge. Thank you. I yield back. It may be a slippery slope, I think. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Perlmutter. You're not going to start singing, are you? Fight, see you down the field. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Olson, it's, ni it's so nice to have you back on this committee. I have to say that. It it's very important that you're on this committee now. So uh, that's a other, whole other s story. So, Professor, I want to talk to you about space law for a second because uh, I practiced. I was a litigator for a long time. I was, did a lot of real estate, securities, that kind of commercial litigation then. And I appreciate your comment about the potential for uh, the venture capital companies to want to invest some more. But I, I guess I'm more concerned that there isn't a body of law. I mean, you say adverse possession. I don't know if the Russians have adverse possession, whether they consider that part of the law or, you know, exactly how you mortgage, you know, in Japan and whether or not the space treaty, and what I what I concerned about is whose body of law controls. Is it the law of the sea? Is it something that we really, in my opinion, we really got a lot of work to do on it if, in fact, we're going to try to retire some of the risk? And I just like your comment, and Mr. French, you may comment on, on it too, if you will, and then I've got some questions about going to Mars. Well, I did read a marvelous article by a professor from South Dakota, I think he was Simmons, who talked about how the um, adverse possession can be viewed through a Marxist lens. So perhaps <laughs> the, it is possible for, for us to persuade the Russians that adverse possession might be a, a tenable approach for establishing property, recognizing property rights um, in outer space. But I think um, one of the other points he made, and I think it was a good one, was that this could all develop organically. Um, you know, one, one approach would be for you all to, to set up some statutory criteria, but otherwise we could see uh, cases in court between two US companies and they go to a court because they've just finally gotten too close to each other and they're annoying each other. So now they want it resolved. And if they're US companies, they'll go to US court. Um, Do, does the space treaty establish little... any kind of a framework if there is conflict um, um, between, you know, two individuals or two countries as to who has that has a claim, and that the other guys jump in the claim? Not for claims, no. It mostly, it's if there's conflicts internationally between countries, you have diplomatic talks but not for individuals, and I do not know, I do not believe there's one for claims in land. Okay. Um, just personally, you know, we passed the Space Resource Exploration and Utilization Act of 2015, which I think gives a little bit, but 
for me, I think we've got just a lot more work to do. I, and I'm speaking as somebody who had to go try these cases. You know, and that's where we have a complete body of, or a pretty good body of law here in the United States about who owns what and who has certain rights to, to those kinds of things. But let, me, let me change the subject for a second because, as you all know, my, my goal on this committee is to help continue to push us to getting our astronauts to Mars on Mars by 2033 when the orbits uh, uh, between the Earth and Mars are the closest. And so uh, to Dr. Lau, to Mr. Stalmer, what kind of, uh, of, what kind of interest is there in the commercial sector uh, on a major mission of that sort? I, I personally think it's got to be international in scope and public-private, and I hope to see NASA in the lead. But how do you see this developing from the commercial uh, sector? So about a year or so ago, uh, at the mandate of this uh, this uh, subcommittee uh, and at the request of NASA, Stipe wrote a report on uh, evaluating the, the prospects of getting to Mars by 2033, and we found that uh, that is not feasible, as you know. Um, if we don't fund it. That was, that was so. one of the assumptions in there. Um, but to, to specifically answer your question, um, uh, you know, commercial entities would be just as happy to take the money as anybody else. So there's no, you know, there's no pushback from commercial uh, sources to get to Mars. The, the important thing to mention is that some of the activities that need to happen, you know, the linchpin of the Mars mission is the deep space transport, the DST. It's a very complicated piece of machinery. It needs to keep humans alive for 1,100 or more days. Uh, it needs to have a power and propulsion system that it that can get it there and back. And it needs to have um, an ECLIS system that is uh, that we do not have. It needs to have almost complete 100% recycling of air, oxygen, et cetera. Uh, these are just very difficult things to do on fixed price sorts of, of, of budgets because they're so high risk. And um, cost plus contracts tend to be better for these. Uh, it's kind of a new venture. Yes. Um, Mr. Having Mr. Stalmer. I would say we, we can't get there in t unless we don't, if we don't start soon. You know, 2033, you put a date out there, and, and we work to that. You, there are technical challenges, but I can tell you that I have um, two, two large members, two individuals that are quite passion, passionate about getting to the moon and beyond and are willing to back that financially uh, with their own personal uh, net worth and are, and are developing systems and have that vision. But you have to build that infrastructure as a stepping stone to that vision. And I, I see that um, with, with the, the lunar program with Artemis, and that's a stepping stone onto Mars. Um, but as I said, we, we can't get there until we start. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So recently had the uh, last, was it last weekend already, to take uh, my family down uh, down to the Cape for the amazing celebration of Apollo, and, and in conversations with my daughter and family, they were astounded uh, as, as much as their, as their dad talks about space and why we need to be there, they were astounded to, to learn that we can't, the United States cannot send humans, we cannot send American astronauts to space. And I think that's always um, worth repeating. Uh, I think that our dependence on the Russian RD-180 is unacceptable, Mr. Stalmer. And, and, and I sit on the Armed Services Committee and see the national security implications of this all the time. So I know the Air Force is working in the right direction with the launch service agreement contracts uh, to improve our domestic capabilities. How can Congress help reduce this dependency also on the, on the civilian side? The dependency on foreign launch vehicles or uh, on innovation of developing newer technologies? Well, I, on the, specifically on the Russian-made rocket engines. Well, I think we're moving beyond that. I, I think there's a limitation on how many more um, Russian um, engines can be used. Um, but what I would focus on is the innovation that you're seeing from several U.S. commercial companies on building new technologies and new engines. The fact that we were, for many years, depend dependent on a Russian engine um, for one of our, our, our main rockets um, is, is, well, that's a, that's a political hot potato. But what, what we are seeing right now, the uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Vector, Rocket Labs, um, uh, uh, well, 
kick me because I, I probably can't name them all. The, yeah. the new Virgin the, um, in Sierra Nevada, the new uh, entrants that are building new American technology, new engines that hasn't been done in 20 years. I think that's a tremendous breakthrough. And I think uh, with Congress's support and the, the certainty on, on certain regulations, we'll, we'll continue this innovative growth on this new technology. Please, please I mean, just in the interest of time, uh, send over any, um, anything else for the record, and that's for all the panels that Congress can help with to get government out of the way of this innovation. We need to create a framework and take the approach of creating a framework that emboldens innovation from the private sector and gets, uh, obviously within reason and with safety first, but gets that gets out of the way. Uh, and and can any way we can be helpful, we stand ready to do, uh, do so. I have Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in my district. They're doing incredible work on space situational awareness and uh, space traffic management. Uh, DOC, the Department of Commerce, recently announced they are beginning to accept space situation awareness data from DOD, the Defense Department, in order to provide a commercial storefront for the private sector and our international partners. Commerce officials, my understanding, have been clear they don't want to be, so to speak, a, a traffic cop in space. Um, how do we... It, and, and this is for anyone, uh, Mr. Stormer, I'll start with you, but how do, how do we ensure the transfer of this responsibility from DOD to commerce is done? And, and again, without creating new levels of bureaucracy or regulatory burden. You, you have to leverage the commercial tools that are out there on the marketplace right now. What satellite companies are using for their own space situational awareness, the, um, the space, uh, what the space data, uh, what's the space, SD, uh, space, space data association, what they're using, uh, the, the commercial products um, that are readily available at an affordable cost. You don't need this long lead time development. You just need to procure uh, commercial products that are existing on the market that everyone else in the world is using. So, uh, are we doing that? Uh, some government agencies are doing that, and I think some government agents could some government agents could be a lot more efficient in the way they procure commercial services. Okay, again, for the record, on which government agencies and which specifically be, we can be happy um, to provide you that list. Ms. Christensen, and just in the time remaining, um, Bryce issued a report on Volusia County in my district. Uh, on their commercial space supply chain um, characterization. So the report stated that since 2000, over 250 venture capital firms have invested nearly 14 billion in startup. Uh, the scale of this investment will have generational consequences for Florida's space triangle, uh, the Cape, Daytona, Orlando, can you describe how the space industry will create jobs up and down the supply chain and those kind of spill-on effects across multiple industries? I, I'm pleased to. And um, the end product of uh, uh, the space uh, businesses that are being funded by venture capital uh, is often um, analytic services, uh, communications technologies, capabilities that support and enhance a wide range of other businesses. For example, um, uh, telecommunications services uh, uh, um, are critical to uh, any number of small businesses uh, uh, that rely on flexibility and um, uh, uh, international, uh, international access. Uh, from that end user and the downstream applications all the way back up through the supply chain, uh, manufacturing, uh, 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 computing capabilities, um, uh, uh, test and evaluation, engineering services, technologists, and then the whole range of uh, uh, per people and services that support companies and a growing ecosystem that are not directly space related but that create jobs for uh, people in support industries, ranging from uh, legal services and consultants to, uh, to um, food, food service workers and um, uh, 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 people in communities that are seeing that growth. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. The uh, Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Wexton for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding, and thank you to the panelists for appearing today. 
Um, I represent Virginia, where we are proudly the home of Wallops Island, the Mars, the Mid-Atlantic Mid Regional Spaceport, and the uh, aerospace industry is very important to us. Um, in particular, in, in my district, uh, is home to what was formerly Orbit Orbital and is now Northrop Grumman, which developed the Antares and Cygnus, Antares rocket and the Cygnus uh, capsule for resupplying the uh, International Space Station. And it's a good example of, I think, Mr. French, in your testimony, you talked about the public investment private service model that we have seen in, uh, in aerospace and in commercial space flight. Um, and as we, as legislators, really have to plan for the future, I guess the question I would have for you, Mr. French, and for you, Ms. Christensen, and it's a kind of a two-part question. Uh, first, can you speak to the projections for the frequency and pace of launches from spaceports in the next decade or couple decades? And uh, related to that, how can spaceports better prepare for the future users and ensure that, that things will be successful for these uh, businesses. I'll start and then I'll let uh, Carissa give you the real data. Um, the, uh, first off, on uh, the, the, the partnership with uh, Northrop Grumman, then Orbital, is a great example of the right factors in place. There was existing launch market um, that they could, they'd NASA could capitalize on and make that partnership happen and, and be successful. And I think you're seeing similar things. Uh, Wallops, I think, is doing a good job in thinking about that um, as it partners strategically uh, with, with different government entities uh, uh, to, to, to make it a sustainable launch site. So that's, that's, what I, that, that's sort of, I think, a very good strategy from the Wallops perspective. And what do you foresee, is there, is there anything else that we can do better, or what do you foresee in terms of the pace of launches coming out of spaceports in the future? Uh, I think from my perspective, the two that um, you've got uh, quite a bit of uh, you know, future demand in those programs you described, I think there's something like 65 launches planned uh, with the NASA commercial crew and cargo programs. Uh, that, that, that Northrop Grumman is a part of. And then I think you have a series of uh, DOD launches that are, that are likely expected, given how important space has become on the national security side. Okay, thank you. Um, we are generally seeing, uh, a, a, with regard to projections for the free frequency and pace of launches, we're seeing increasing launches in recent years and will likely in the next few years. That said, launch is often cyclical, particularly as we're seeing the launch of larger constellations, which then will have a pause and then need to be replenished. But, but in, in recent years, in the foreseeable future, we're seeing growth. With regard to how spaceports uh, can better prepare, I, I would note uh, two things. One is building partnerships with launch providers, which is clearly an area of great success for Wallops. And the second is, um, uh, engaging with small satellite operators who will have different needs than satellite operators that launch large satellites with regard to on uh, facility services, integration, and so on. And is that because that's an emerging market that it hasn't gotten enough attention recently? Or? Uh, um, it, it's certainly small satellite operators are the primary uh, satellite recipient of venture funds. And uh, small satellite startups and emerging firms are seeking to launch large constellations of small satellites. And they are, they are reaching the point where they are ready to uh, begin launching. Okay. And so that, those deployment challenges will start to be more and more important. Very good, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Stalmer, I see that you serve in a number of roles within the FAA's rulemaking committees, including space launch and reentry and spaceports as well as FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. And one of the concerns I have is that you may recall that at Wallops we had a pretty harrowing crash a few years back. And there seems to be some, some variance in the industry about how accident investigations are conducted um, for these commercial launches in terms of who conducts the, the uh, investigation and whether uh, the government, is, whether the industry is going to self-investigate or if NASA is going to lead or independently investigate. And so um, as we look into these issues, how can we ensure that there's transparency in the safety process as we look to expand uh, commercial space travel? I think the best way for transparency is, is the partnership between both parties, whether it's 
you know, with a, a government facility, a launch facility, uh, and the the uh, the, customer, the launching um, party. So if, for instance, with Orbital ATK, working closely with NASA on the investigation uh, that happened, I believe that happened in October of 2014, mm -hmm. um, to find it, to come to the, the accurate conclusion in the, soon, uh, the quickest amount of time, but going through a thorough investigation together, because I think you need the expertise from both parties. Um, Congressman, if, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, as you brought up some of the, the, the issues that the ranges have, especially in Wallops and on the, these East Coast ranges. With the chairwoman's indulgence, oh. I don't mind at all. Because I, I think it's rather, it's rather pertinent what some of the issues that the spaceports are are dealing with is, um, and the launch industry is dealing with wallops and, and down on the Cape, is the integration of, of our national air, um, air, the national airspace system, uh, the NAS, and this is a, a finite resource that we have of the, the airspace. So whenever there's a space launch, we need to coordinate with uh, the aviation community, and this has been a problem at Wallops in the past, which caused a delay of one of the uh, one of the launch vehicles. I've and heard about it on the FAA side too. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's one of, of the, the different committees, uh, unpaid committees that I'm working on. Um, uh, that that's one of the big issues that we ha are having is is working with the aviation community and the launch community on how we can effectively manage the national um, airspace system. So, and thank you for being my congresswoman. <laughs> You're very welcome, thanks. And with that, I'll yield back. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Wexton. The, the chair now recognizes Mr. Posey for uh, five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for holding this great uh, meeting. And uh, thank the uh, panel for being here. I had to step away for a few minutes. Secretary Chow was announcing some uh, grants that were approved, and one of them happened to be something we've worked on for a couple of years involved $90 million to access Kennedy Space Center. So, you know, if we can't get there, if the bridge collapses, we don't have a space center. So had to step away for a few minutes. And, uh, you know, in Florida alone, the space industry totals, the impact totals $19 billion, 130,000 jobs in our state. So it's, it's really big. Uh, space is important, but it's the commercial and civil space working together that really drives it, as most of you already know. Another driver is the space... Uh, Resource Utilization Act, which I introduced with Representative Kilmer in uh, 2015, which is now law. And it allows for uh, U.S. entities to retain the rights of resources they extract from celestial bodies, uh, like asteroids. And it provides legal certainty for those uh, who make significant investments to pursue space-based resources, uh, like platinum, gold, and other high-value minerals. And uh, think about much as you would have the California Gold Rush, except this is in space. And understand there was some discussion about that as to whether or not uh, this legislation had any property rights claiming in it. And let me assure you absolutely positively, unequivocally, beyond any shadow of doubt, it did not. It refers only to resources. And so, you know, we don't lay claim to any celestial bodies because of that particular legislation. And it's just <laughs> clear of the air. I think that should be understood by everyone. Uh, Ms. Montgomery, in your testimony, you said that uh, Space Resource Exploration and Utilization Act of 2015 resolved one half of the uncertainty by recognizing uh, private claims to extracted resources. And uh, would you say that this then has helped develop the commercial entry into to what we see today? I would say it has been very helpful. Great. So. You can pontificate oh, longer okay. if you like. All right, I will. <laughs> no, I think that it has helped set to rest a lot of uncertainty that the private sector felt about whether it could legitimately claim um, it rights in the resources it, it worked to get. So, you know, the Moon Treaty is out there. The United States hasn't signed it, but it confuses people. And the ban on national appropriation also confuses people. So I think that what Congress did in 2015 really cleared the air. It was helpful. Yeah, we, you know, we hear from some great panels in this committee. I mean, it, I think this is the greatest committee in the world to be on. And here's some great, interesting, learned people. And uh, we were told one time they, they think they've identified an asteroid with more platinum-based deposits on it than have been mined from the history or from on, on, on Earth in, during the entire history of man. Wow. I mean, that's a lot. And, you know, we know the environmental damage this mining does, and we know if we can pluck this stuff off an asteroid, you know, it's so much better for everybody. You know, win, 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 win situation. Uh, Mr. Stalmer, 
Uh, would you say the law has helped develop the commercial space industry and what we're seeing today? Yes. No, just, uh, <laughs> and I'll elaborate. No, I, I think uh, your leadership and working with uh, Congressman Kilmer was um, really breakthrough for the, the resources, in space resources, and how we uh, pursue that. And I, and I really think um, the long term impact of, of that type of legislation, uh, we, won't, we won't really see the benefits until years to come, but I think it was very foresightful uh, on that legislation. So I think it will have a huge impact on the commercial industry. Yeah, I remember hearing Neil deGrasse Tyson when he lectured here before we had him as a witness one time. He lectured in the Jefferson Building, and he said, you know, space is the only thing that we really spend uh, money on, that Congress spends money on, that doesn't benefit us here today. That's really in the best interest of future generations, uh, like uh, planting trees, the shade from which you never expect to enjoy the shade. And I, and I think that's great, and I, and I hope that helps energize and helps interest um, more of our young people. Got 33 seconds left, if anybody wants to weigh in on that. Um, uh, we wrote a report recently at NASA's request on uh, uh, asteroid mining, and uh, it's step zero is knowing what the potential of, uh, of asteroids is. But then there's steps one through seven, you know, you, from prospecting to going, getting to the asteroid to mining it to bringing things back, and there's a cost associated with each. And the trade-off that needs to be done is how much would it cost to get there and bring the uh, material back, and if that a number is a positive number. So that's just something to think about. Thank you. Time's expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Posey. I, I agree. I think this is the greatest committee. Uh, not only do we have space for fun, uh, Mr. Weber, but we're doing important uh, work and raising important questions. So the chair now recognizes Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your indulgence. Let me participate. Um, Ms. Montgomery, I'm, I'm a little bit fascinated by your testimony on space law. How long have you been kind of in space law? Um, going on 30 years, I was in private practice and did some satellite work, and then about 25 years ago, I joined the FAA, where I spent 22 years doing space law. Okay, and I noticed Rockets. you talked about in 67, there were signatories uh, to the treaty, and of course, that would have been under Nixon, and you said it was ratified by the Senate, I believe? Yes, yes, it was. Okay. And you were not—you weren't even in elementary school at that point. So I'm fascinated by your learn, your learned. So Sir, quick. I was in elementary <laughs> school. <laughs> Work with me here. I'm trying to help you. So, but I have uh, to be truthful. <laughs> no, well, I appreciate that, as any good counselor would. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm reading about the case uh, where you're talking about what kind of law would govern this. And the reason I'm saying that is because we're going to talk about some SpaceX stuff and their failure. And you cite the case uh, Medellin versus Texas from 2008, which I'm thoroughly familiar with because it was a Mexican national that raped and killed two girls and was sentenced to death. And I, and I was going in as a state legislator nominee during there and was following that very closely. And you talk about the ruling where they said that the, those kinds of treaties, because the Mexican government sued, of course, wanted to make th that his rights were violated. He didn't get notified that he had the right to contact his embassy. And you know the case. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated that you, you say that that might apply to space treaties. Now, go ahead. Yes, it, I would say it does, because um, in the law, you can have principles that will apply across um, industries or situations, if, if even though they're all very different. So although the treaty was ratified, that is different from whether it is self-executing or not. And so when the Supreme Court talked about the treaty at issue in in the Medellin case, right. it articulated the principle that if a treaty has been signed onto and ratified, but the uh, entity in the U.S. government that it obligates is the U.S. Congress, then everyone has to wait for the U.S. Congress to act, to act yeah, that, by right. passing a law. Right, and, and I agreed with that opinion, by the way, just for the record. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to fast forward. How many other attorneys are there that, and, and you may not know this, that where do they teach space law? Where is that taught? I notice you're from um, what college? Um, I teach at Catholic University's Columbus School okay. of Law. There is also, um, sorry, uh, Representative Brooks is in here, um, Ole Miss okay. has a space law course. Nebraska has a space law curriculum. 
And then um, Georgetown and GW also teach, have space law classes, American University space law classes. Right. My, and McGill in Canada. My I, fear I, is that we don't want those international, indeed, extraterrestrial, if you will, treaties being applied down in the various and sundry states and being hampering what commercial space exploration could do. And I'm thinking about, is there a move to take that law and to hold countries and states accountable? Have you seen that any at all? Uh, yes, sir. Um, when Moon Express went to the FAA for a payload review, the FAA did grant it, but it said in its press release that we are concerned that they're not going to be regulated and it's good they're only there for two weeks. Otherwise, under Article 6, we would perhaps have had to say no. And I would say that that is contrary to the Supreme Court's articulation of how... And, and you noted in one of your footnotes work. that one of the administrations uh, had took a different view of Article 6, one of the preclusions. Was that the Obama administration? Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I gathered by the date. Let me move forward here. I'm deeply concerned about the secrecy uh, surrounding the launch pad explosion that, ex that uh, destroyed SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Are you all familiar with that? I'm not getting all heads and shakes. Okay. Uh, as you know, that was an unmanned test at Cape Canaveral, uh, and it was recently revealed that a critical parachute failure occurred during the Dragon test capsule in April. You all are all aware of that. No, I'm not getting all head shakes. Okay. Um, this was kept secret from the public. So this mishap is especially distressing given that NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel specifically directed that parachute designs be finalized and proven before test flights occur. Back to the counselor. Ms. Montgomery, this should be governed by state law, federal law. Does it fall under the purview of the space treaty? What say you? It is governed by the FAA regulation, the Commercial Space Launch Act and the FAA regulations in terms of um, prepare. I'm not really that familiar with the incident, but okay. if, was it for a commercial crew or was it? Uh, it, was a, it was unmanned, but yes, it was for a commercial crew. Okay, so um, as you may be aware, Congress told the FAA that it could not regulate for the safety of persons on board until 2023, that um, the industry is supposed to have the same um, sort of barnstorming era that the uh, aviation industry got in the early days so that the, F the FAA may be hampered in its ability to look at that. I don't know, but I stress that. I don't know because I don't... Well, I know Mr. Stalmer made a comment in his uh, comments, his remarks, that the FAA had only gone halfway toward regulations, I believe you said, hadn't gone far enough. And I just want us to be careful to know who's going to be controlling, who's going to be regulating, what law governs. You have a comment? Madam Chair, if you'll indulge me. Mr. Stalmer? Yes. Uh, I, I, what I was referring to was the, uh, the halfway is in this current NPRM on some of the, the regulatory okay. and the streamlining. Oh, okay, I got you. Thank you, and I appreciate your indulgence. I'll thank, back. You, thank you, Mr. Weber, and, and thank you for raising, I think, some very important questions, and, uh, and thank you to our panel. If, if it wasn't clear before we started, uh, there are a lot of issues that face us uh, about commercial space. What exactly that is, Dr. Lal, to your point, uh, how we classify it, uh, how we quantify it, how we set the stage to encourage growth, uh, but also uh, provide accountability and certainty moving forward and, and establish a, a legal framework where it doesn't exist or address, uh, address, the, uh, address the need for a legal framework where one doesn't necessarily exist in the regulatory environment in order to make all of these things possible. Uh, taking this away, we clearly have a lot to, to look at moving forward. And, and I'll just sum it up with a, with a few observations. There are a few buckets that, that I think we need to, to look at. One is, what is the right level of, of oversight and investigation and, and how we can, and transparency, I think to your point, Mr. Weber, uh, because that falls under a NASA contract and how, how, we, how we look at that, uh, the, the regulatory framework and, and all of the things that are involved in that. And then what is commercial space? If 90% if of a given program uh, is a, a NASA program is, is funded by the government, w at what point does that become commercial and where do, where do those, those issues enter in? And, and, and the, the overall question is that 
where the markets have developed in, in the places where they exist independently of a, a government customer, again, going back, uh, Dr. Lal, to your initial testimony that despite innovation, the principal customer for many of these areas is still the government, which we see how to set the regulatory framework, how to create the right balance, and how to properly define what is what is governmental with, with private industry being a part of that and what is truly commercial for the sake of commercial and how we set the stage. So clearly a lot of issues that we have to tackle moving forward and sincerely appreciate your testimony and, and your, uh, your, in, your engagement today as well as all of our, our committee. I think this just goes back to the importance uh, of, of the work that we're doing here and, and I think a, a, very clear, uh, a very clear bipartisan concern for doing the best we can to set this up uh, to succeed in many ways. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for your attention, your testimony, and uh, oh, okay, wait, I got, I got to make sure I read the, the rest of the things. Um, <laughs> before, uh, before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, and the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses, I would say be prepared. Uh, we may have additional questions. And the witnesses are excused and this hearing is adjourned.